That's where I first met Kelvin. It was very clear that Kelvin could have been a comedian. <laughs> uh, the world lost a great man uh, when he decided to go into politics. Anyway, I've just got to set the alarm for how long I have to talk, because uh, you don't want to run over. And uh, so I'll just set that for three to the end. I've, <laughs> I've made this mistake before. I've got to remember to make it PM. <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing a show and I, I left it at AM and then about three hours into the show, which was only meant to go 20 minutes, I was the only person left in the room. <laughs> uh, at 3.30 AM the next morning, I went home. Um, okay, well look, um, there's not much I can say that hasn't been said. I mean, I can say things that haven't been said, but in terms of covering the substantive issues, no. Um, but I'd like to begin, and look, people say these issues are so big, so important, uh, that we should just deal with them and not play the blame game. Um, now, some days I have good days and some days I have bad days about these issues, and some days I think, no, well, you shouldn't blame people, you should embrace them and bring them into the fold and don't make this any sort of argument about who did what and who's to blame. Um, but I can't let this go. Um, I blame God. <laughs> okay? I just want to, I've never done this before, but I want to quote to you from the Bible. Be fruitful and multiply <laughs> and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed which is upon the face of the earth and every tree in which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed so that you shall have it for meat. Now, that's at the very heart of our problem. That's the Western myth that we have dominion over the earth. Um, population has made that dominion uh, unbearable. Um, I, I, when I was born in 1928, um, <laughs> there were, uh, it's, it's a bit hard to tell, them, but there are a little over two million people. Thanks to the Second World War, we got rid of a lot of people. And if you're really looking for an instant solution um, to the problems of the world, let me recommend World War to you. Um, it's dependable and it requires no really great policy decisions. Um, but just going back in time, um, which is what I always do, uh, having blamed God, uh, really, it, it really all began with the Big Bang. I've told people that before. If it hadn't have been for the creation of the universe, we wouldn't be sitting here today with these problems. Now, whether God did it or it was just something that happened, I don't really know, but I'll continue to blame God. Um, and look, nothing much happened really till the Earth was formed and then water came to the planet, and that's where life began. Life began with water, and with life, of course, came David Attenborough. And if you look at him, <laughs> you'll see he looks old enough to have been there at the beginning. But then we move on to 20,000 years ago, the end of the last uh, major ice age. At the end of the last ice age, there were possibly, and it's again very hard to tell, possibly 50,000 Homo sapiens on the planet about uh, 20,000 years ago. Not a big starting point. And life went on as it did, and we became agricultural, uh, uh, we became hunter-gatherers, nomadic people. And then 12,000 years ago, at the, as the earth began to warm, this is where we made the big mistake. We became agriculturalists. We settled down, we started scouring the earth, we started rearranging nature, we started domesticating animals, and we started pushing hunter-gatherers and nomadic people off fertile lands and taking them for ourselves. And when land, the ownership of land itself became uh, a big issue, um, then we had conflict. And scientists now have traced climate change back to that moment in time when people first started um, ploughing the earth. This, uh, they can trace carbon dioxide emissions from the early agriculture there. But look, uh, 12,000 years ago, I don't know, there might have been 150, 200,000 people around the time of Christ. Um, what, do you know? Three million. Three million at the time of Christ, yes, okay. Uh, but one of them was Christ, who wasn't really a person. So <laughs> 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 Yeah. <laughs>
three million people. And we went along, and life was pretty, but look, it was, it was some form of uh, imperial feudalism the whole way along. There was the majority worked for the minority. And then we came to uh, the Little Ice Age, which began in the mid-1300s and went on for a, about 300 years. The, the first major climate, dramatic climate change um, since human beings have uh, moved into the world of, world of agriculture. It decimated Europe, it decimated China, it had uh, implications political and social. Uh, because the number of people who died, it was the time of the plague as well, and people think the plague was in part so successful because uh, human conditions were so uh, stressed because of famine uh, that it took a real hold, and 30 to 60 percent of Europeans died during that uh, period, which meant there were less workers than there were needed. So all of a sudden, labour. Um, had the upper hand in negotiations with wealth and power. And this was the rise of uh, the call for democracy. Uh, it changed the nature of states around the world. And uh, it um, opened up uh, mercantilism and industry. And so we started to harness powers, uh, particularly as we got into the 1700s, we started to harness the power of fossil fuels. And so, um, what did I read the other day? A barrel of one barrel of oil contains the equivalent energy of one man working 40 hours a week for 11 years. That's how much energy is in oil. And we've used that energy to substantially transform the world that we live in. It's given us power beyond comprehension. The other thing that's helped too is the rise of science because science has given us the means to exploit those things, but science has given us medicine. And I'm looking around here, a hundred years ago, 75% of you would be dead. <laughs> we would be sitting in a room with a few young people and lots and lots of skeletons. <laughs> Medical science has improved uh, the, uh, the options for people's health and longevity immensely. So now we live longer. Um, the other thing that came along, when I was born, 1948, I'll be honest about it, 1948. Uh, Catherine, how many were there in 1948? Ooh, two point two and a half billion. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Yeah. Two point five billion. So we're hey, we're doing well, you and I. <laughs> One of us didn't have to turn up. Nineteen forty-eight. <laughs> <laughs> um, By nineteen sixty, um, we'd reached uh, three billion. And you all know today, uh, twenty sixteen. In fact, we topped it. I think in twenty fourteen, uh, we reached seven billion. So it's an exponential growth that's unprecedented. It is extraordinary. In my lifetime, an additional four billion people have, uh, have um, come to the planet. Now, in uh, 1940, I'm sorry, an additional uh, 5.5 billion. Uh, when I was, I knew most of those people when I was born. It was possible to know uh, almost everybody when you were born. We now live in a world almost entirely of strangers. Um, and because it's so big and so complicated, and because societies impose stresses on people which really quite um, change and fragment the way we live as a society, um, we live with strangers and we don't know what they think or what they're doing. Um, and the problem with the world is, uh, the world looks like this. Now most people, if you said to somebody, draw the world, they do that. And you know, they'd put a couple of countries there and a few islands and one thing and another. But it doesn't look like that. The world looks like this. It's one giant, enormous <laughs> ass, And it's called Rupert Murdoch. <laughs> now, we've talked about why we can't get the message across. It's because of him. Everybody's up that ass. Alfred <laughs> Turnbull's up that ass. Tony Abbott couldn't be any further up that ass. Bill Shorten's up that ass. Uh, Gina Reinhardt's up that ass. And interestingly, Andrew Bolt's up Gina Reinhardt's ass. <laughs> so it's sort of like a babushka doll of asses. And you know, since I've been here this afternoon, the question has come again and again how do we change people's perception? How do we get the information that. Uh, people like Catherine have, how do we get that into the into the dialogue? And then to sit up the back and hear people like Kelvin Thompson accuse the ABC of not meeting its task as a, a broadcaster and informer of the nation is deeply shocking. There's <laughs> nothing left. If you haven't got the ABC, there's nothing left. And look at this. We'll play a guessing game because we need a bit of fun at the end. Here we go. Okay. Hangman. Yeah, hangman. Letter? 
I no. I <laughs> sorry. to smart people. E. E. Oh, thank you. <laughs> oh, there's so many. P. T. Oh, T. No. Now, incidentally, uh, this is a piece of timber here, because uh, when you see it finally done and the body hangs here, the tendency is for the whole system to rotate that way and you need a compression. E. I studied architecture. E. No, and here I'll put a piece of wire because that's intention. Okay? <laughs> and it's important to know about these things because the problems we face now are not population, they're not climate change, they're not peak oil, they're not peak food, they're not peak... It's a completely and utterly systemic problem. It's a wicked problem. A wicked problem has no solution. So, any more guesses? You. 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 No! I'm going to win. Wow. Well. <laughs> what are you thinking? Aren't you going, Whoa, Gee, what? what? Oh. Oh. <coughs> oh. What have I done? Yeah. What was that one? Oh. Ah. Oh. Aspro. Yeah. Aspro. Aspro. <laughs> C. C. No, it was Aspro. C. No, it's CSIRO. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's a CSIRO. <laughs> and you may notice that we took funding. Uh, we, we've 160 climate scientists have been stacked. Uh, sack. We're going backwards. We're just going backwards. The best intentions of all the wonderful people that I meet as I go about my life, uh, we've just completely and utterly going backwards. Um, to, in the United States at the moment, 81% of Americans <coughs> now believe that climate change is human made. 81% in America. It's quite extraordinary because in the Northern Hemisphere, um, they have had the most extraordinary run of cold and hot weather over the last three years. Here in Melbourne we've been a little immune from it, but Sydney's had its hottest uh, uh, late summer, early autumn on record, as much of Northern Australia has. Uh, last month, the hottest March ever recorded, and it was a month that was so far above the average that it set a record for a, 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 a monthly average above the normal. Uh, we reached two degrees C. Uh, for a couple of days there in March. We had the Paris climate talks, which most people missed because there was a terrorist attack before it and Christmas after it, and how could you put climate change into that context and make a, an impression. Uh, they began uh, those talks with a claim of 2 degrees C, we're going to hold it at 2 degrees C. They ended it by saying we won't hold it at 1.5 degrees C. Um, it's now impossible to reach either of those targets, we've passed them. And that's one of the joys of the issues that you discuss here today, because nature will now take care of the population problem. Um, we are driving uh, 100 to 200 species extinct every day, and slowly as we move on, we will become one of those species that starts to become extinct. Um, we, uh, oh, how many sheets of paper am I willing to waste on you? It's all I have. Because <laughs> <laughs> you know, they're thirty-five dollars these things. <laughs> I'll have a think about it. So we have we have this issue, and look, in a lot of ways, population is the problem. Um, you know, Paul Ehrlich uh, put out the book. Uh, um, um, what was it called? Population oh, bomb. Uh, that one. Yeah. Um, and predicted that uh, you know the world would, the population would consume the earth and we'd all die a long time ago. But we had the green revolution, and the green revolution was built entirely on hydrocarbons. It was converting of uh, uh, fossil fuels into uh, fertilisers and uh, into um, uh, sprays to kill off uh, things. We've destroyed the soil. Forty percent of the soil, uh, active soil of the earth now, is approaching death. Uh, it's lost its microbial life, um, where our water and our aquifers are draining, water patterns are changing, uh, heat patterns are changing, weather patterns are changing. Uh, we talked earlier about the problem of refugees, and this is where, this is where the, the issue of how many people do you fit in Australia. Um, I did read some time ago that uh, in terms of our natural capital, we probably should settle in at about 16 or 17 million people if we wanted to live sustainably. We can't do that. The nature of 
fossil fuels means that we can import uh, those things that we can no longer supply in total for ourselves. And what Australia does mostly is export water in the, in, in the foodstuffs that we export. We're ex actually exporting our water, but we're running out of water. And you see the Chinese now are buying agricultural land mm. all over the world, and they're buying water all over the world, and they hold on to Tibet because of water, and the water's running out. Now, China's got nuclear weapons. Um, they depend on the Tibetan Plateau for their water running down their major rivers. Uh, India requires that water too. Pakistan, and both of them have got atomic weapons. Um, there will become a point where uh, the water stress becomes so great that they're going to have to decide who gets it. And generally, you know, the idea possibly of uh, some sort of nuclear exchange is not out of the question. Now, that will uh, slow global warming. So it's a good thing <laughs> because we'll have a minor nuclear winter. So these things ultimately will uh, balance out. But the issue of refugees, here's the Middle East. Okay, the Middle East basically, here's the, here's the Mediterranean, Italy, Greece, uh, North Africa there. And then Syria is sort of... <laughs> I read the Herald Sun, I've got no idea. Syria is <laughs> sort of there. Okay, now the Arab Spring. The Arab Spring began uh, in Egypt in uh, 2010. And in 2010 they had the worst bushfires ever recorded in Russia. They lost 40% of their food stock. The Russians decided they wouldn't export any grain. Egypt is the largest importer of wheat in the world and they lost their major exporter. And they had a food crisis. And that food crisis expressed itself on the streets as a rebellion that turned into a revolution. And so you had this cascading of, um, or toppling of the dominoes of, uh, of the Arab world. Syria, <coughs> If you don't know why it is or what it is, in the southeast of Syria, um, I think just starting, well, just starting only a few years ago, they had the worst drought ever recorded. The worst drought ever recorded. Now these are subsistence, not very sophisticated people. 800,000 of them, families, women, children, grandmas, grandpas, all moved uh, uh, west um, into the capital. And they bought their form of, uh, um, well, it was like the Grapes of Wrath. If, you, if you've seen the film, you don't know, but if you've read the book, there were people standing on the border of California with guns, stopping the people of the Midwest escaping the drought of the 1930s, refusing them entry into California because they thought they'd take their jobs, they thought they'd take their food. And this is what's happened here. This began the great ferment that now is Syria. And the refugee problem in Europe is incredible. We're very lucky that we're surrounded by water and we're very lucky to have a Liberal government that's compassionate. <laughs> it doesn't want to see people drown at sea. Um, it was mentioned before that um, the big end of town doesn't frame things in terms of we want this for more profit, we want this for jobs growth and a better life for you and your children, blah blah blah. They're beautiful at reframing the, the landscape. Now, it used to be we will decide who comes into our country and under what circumstances. But as more and more Australians opened themselves to the idea of compassion for refugees, and that policy became a little bit irksome, somebody, probably in the IPA, the Institute of Public Affairs, came up with the idea of let's pretend the Liberals are compassionate. <laughs> let's pretend they care about the disadvantaged and the, the lost and uh, the flotsam and jetsam of the world. And we're compassionate now, we don't want them to drown. So that's why they can't come. Because now we could, if we cared, we could send, I don't know, um, Susie, whatever, we could teach them to swim. <laughs> we could go to Indonesia and give them swimming lessons before they came. If we cared, that's what we'd do. But we're going to find these great, um, these great comings together of all these problems. The problem of population, and that's, uh, look, I mean, I, I've followed uh, what Kelvin said about this. He's an extraordinarily brave and courageous person to speak the way he does about this issue because nobody will speak about it. And the defences put up by the growth industry are almost unbreakable because you will be framed as a racist. Uh, you will be framed as somebody who wants us to live in third world poverty. You, it's a battle that's very difficult to win. But we've also got climate change and that is here and now 
2013, hottest year ever recorded. That record was beat in 14, and it was beaten again last year. 2015 was the hottest year ever recorded. The three, first three months of this, this year will make this year even hotter. So climate change is here. The impacts are becoming real. We're going to lose uh, environments. We're going to lose food sources. We're going to lose all of those things, which are going to put immense pressure on population. And so we will start to lose people. And um, it's, a, it's a dramatic way of solving your problems. I don't think politics is... A, do you feel politics is going to help us in this, Kelvin? Do you think really that we can keep lobbying these people and hope that somewhere a policy would come? Uh, I, I don't see any immediate... No, I don't see any immediate... So really, it's, it's in our own hands, and that, that's not something that's easy to say. I look at the refugee problem and the way we treat asylum seekers here, and I think, well, that's something over time that if you lobby hard enough and, you know, you drip and drip and drip away, you can change that policy. But the really big policies that we should be talking about, population, climate change, um, peak water, peak land, all of those things, um, the longer you wait, the worse they get. The day, uh, the, the day to stop um, uh, the temperature going over the two degrees threshold was somewhere in 1980. Somewhere in 1980, a molecule of CO2 went into the atmosphere that guaranteed we would exceed <laughs> two degrees centigrade. That's, you can't solve these problems without a time machine. And I suggest that there are very bright people. I only meet intelligent, bright, thoughtful people. And if between you, you can't invent a time machine and go back to the moment when John Howard was conceived and throw a bucket of water over his parents, because that's a big turning point. And now, now we've got, I mean, Abbott's gone, although he hasn't really gone. And if Malcolm Turnbull was any sort of person, he would go to the sports uh, and leisure department and say, what I want you to do is organise a triathlon for every day of the year up until the next election. And Abbott will be gone. He'll be running all over, triathlon here, triathlon there, triathlon there, and he'll be out of the way. But they're not smart. They don't think of those things. They're not leading us through the darkness into the light. Uh, these people are a real problem. So we've got climate change, we've got soil, uh, we've got water is a really, really big issue. And in a country like Australia, the wide brown land, a huge issue. And all of these things ultimately are going to impact on us. Um, they already are taking lives around the world. They're not in great numbers, but um, the, the uh, heat wave of 1997, I think, in Europe, or 98, 97, um, 50,000 people died above the average over that heat wave. In, uh, in Russia, 300,000 people a week left Moscow to get away from the heat and the smoke and thousands of people died in that heat wave as well. Um, we will get to play at times here in Victoria now where uh, our air conditioner just won't cope. It will be so hot outside the air conditioner will be no help to you. The stress on the power grid will be unbearable. So they're all the sort of, and I could go on about all these different sorts of problems, but these are all the problems that we're dealing with simultaneously. And it's, I mean, it's easy in one way to say, well, look, if we could get population under control, that would be it. But all of these problems are really the cause of perhaps 25, 30% of the world's population, the first world rich countries that consume vastly more than people uh, in the uh, second and third world. So we've got to look at the way we live our lives. We've got to look at uh, sustainability, those issues we've talked about before. Um, but, yeah. There must be something you can put in a water supply. <laughs> and I'm not sure what it is, but there must be something you can put in a water supply. It's like poison blankets. <laughs> yeah, because I, yes, exactly. Because <laughs> I saw, uh, I heard somebody on the radio yesterday who's got six children under eight. Oh. And you think, well, you know, you're probably going to be a really lovely mother up until the crisis. People are having six children. 
um, the baby bonus, which is an extraordinary invitation for people under the age of 15 to have sex so they could pay for their drug habit. Um, <laughs> but just irresponsible, ignorant, stupid people. George Brandis is in Parliament, for God's sake. The people that are in Parliament are absolutely stupid puppets. And two members of the IPA now have got pre-selection for the Liberal Party. Mm -hmm. We're going to get these people who shovel shit into the heads of vacuous Liberals and Labor Party people take it on, I'm sure they monitor what's going on. It fills the pages of Andrew Bolt's columns, they write his muck for him. Um, we are so far behind the education ball, we are so far behind getting the information out, it's extraordinary. You really, as individuals now, have to make very difficult decisions. And I think one of them is conversations. There are uh, 7 billion people, so start the conversations now. Right, you don't want to wait till 2050 when there's 10 billion. You'll never get round to all those people by yourself. We've got to start the conversations now. And I know you people do. And I always, like uh, the people up here on the stage, only, or very, <coughs> most often, only talk to people who know what we're talking about anyway. Um, and so you sort of feel in, in some way that, um, well, as I've always said, I've always felt like Vera Lynn. It's just my job to entertain the troops. Um, but we... Isn't that a shame? I won't get to my conclusion. So, um, <laughs> um, are there any questions? <laughs> the microphone here, if anybody's got any questions. Maybe at the end of the panel. Oh yeah, no, that's yeah. okay. That's fine, but thank you. Thank you very much.